nice. If there was ever an Orwellian term, this is it. Nice, okay? <laughs> Let me share with you some of the decisions nice has made. Okay, what do they do? They use quality, quality adjusted life years to make their decisions. So let's say somebody's coming in for a hip replacement. Okay, here's how we look at it. Zero is if you're dead. If you're dead, we give you a zero. This guy looks like a young, healthy guy. We'll give him a one. So you're, you're dead. He's a one. Now, what if we got a little old lady in her 70s, broken hip, and we're talking about doing a hip replacement. So we say her quality of life is 0.5. She's got a 0.5 quality of life. Okay? Now, we could move her up to a 0.7 if we replace this hip. So the difference is 0.2. So we're going to increase her, increase her quality of life 0.2, whatever the hell that means. Okay, 0.2. <laughs> so, and we, we think she's only going to live 15 years. You know, she's 70 now, and we'll say she's going to live to 85. So we'll take the 15 years times the 0.2, and that gives us three quality adjusted life years. And the procedure is going to cost $15,000. So we're going to divide by three quality, comes out to $5,000. And, and we're going to have a level. We're going to say, Anything above X thousand dollars, we won't cover. Anything below, we will cover. So let, let's say the cut is five thousand dollars, we'll cover it. Let's say the cut is four thousand dollars, we're not going to cover it. Okay? Simple. Okay, let's see what kind of decisions were made. See, the UK set up NICE back in 1998. So they've been at this for about 10, 11 years. Okay, here's one of the decisions. Wet macular degeneration, damage to the retina. Drug wound. You go blind, hers in the older age groups. <clears throat> For cost effectiveness purposes, they decided, they determined that you have to go blind in one eye before we're going to start treating this. Lose vision in one eye before we even start to treat you. <clears throat> For cost effectiveness purposes. Well, that was back in 2002. Well, let me bring you up to speed. <clears throat> Here's a lady. She's got cancer of the bowel. Ah, she's an old lady. She's 53. She's a real old lady. <laughs> ah, it's like a death sentence. A judge cannot condemn you to death, but these people can. <clears throat> Despite her oncologist and general practitioner showing proof that the drug worked, there was a drug fighting cancer that they wanted to use. They used it. They showed it worked. Still, they wouldn't cover it. They would not cover it. It's one thing to be dying of cancer. It's another thing to be laying there dying of cancer trying to fight for the medicine you need. Okay, so the panel took another, you know, they put another application to see if we can get coverage, and the panel took a look, and the panel said, the panel looking at the application felt that this patient's case was not significantly different from other patients with this disease, and therefore to fund the treatment would be unfair to other patients with the same condition. I would argue maybe it's unfair to all those patients for not treating all of them. But she's an old lady, she's 53, and we just let her go on her way. Okay. As a physician, patient doctor relationship, what do I do? I got a guy here at this other table, he's got a terminal uh, cancer, he's seeing me, and I know there's a drug that can help him. He's got a kidney cancer or something. I also know this drug's available in the I also know it's not covered. I also know, and Christ, the kid's a student, he doesn't have much money. So what do I do? And I, and I know, I know he feels bad because I'm telling him you've got terminal cancer. So what do I do? Should I tell you about this drug? Or should I not tell you about the drug? If I tell you about the drug, if you think you feel bad now, you could feel even worse. Well, it turns out, they check with the docs in the UK, 80% of the docs are not telling their patients about this drug. Well, we about the 20% of the town. Up until this year. I'm sorry, up until last year. Let's say this kid comes in. I tell him about the drug. 
he doesn't have the money, but he takes up a collection at the university here, and he gets the money. And he gets the drug, because it's available. It's been passed, it's been approved, it's on, it's on, the, uh, it's on the, the shelf in the drugstore. Okay. So he buys it, and he takes the first pill. And what happens? Up until last year, at that point right there, all care under the British, British health system stops. Your doctor visits, your lab, your hospitals, we ain't paying. Why? dig into this further on the, on the bottom of all these slides, I, I've got the actual URL. You just click on there. That takes you to these newspapers, and that takes you to these stories. This was uh, May 2009. This, this is current information. Okay, now this guy. This guy here. This is May 15, 2009. He's got bowel cancer, and it's metastatic. Not only does he have the main cancer, but it's spreading. And we know it's spreading. So you can imagine sitting there thinking, my God, i got cancer, and it's spreading. Okay? Fortunately, there's a drug. There's a drug that can save them, can help them. Okay, but unfortunately, it's not covered. It's not covered. However, if you're looking into it, uh, and what they're doing is they're going to publish their final guidance in July. So this is back in May. So here you are, wait until the July, not to start the medicine, but to find out if you're going to be able to take the medicine, if they're going to cover it. Meanwhile, as you're laying in your bed that night, you know that cancer is spreading. Okay, 35 years old. For a college student, that's still old, but maybe not too old, okay? This guy's got kidney cancer. <clears throat> There's a drug, Sunitatib, that, that cure it, cure it, save them, whatever, and it's not covered. So what do they do with this all? their standard of care. He was offered interleukin-2 with interferon as the current standard treatment. The drug had severe side effects, including nausea, he lost weight, uh, and he didn't respond. Uh, less than 10% of patients respond to that therapy versus sunitidib, which they do respond. Okay? So what is this kid doing? He's sending letters, he's making calls, he's fighting, he's fighting, he's fighting to get this medication. And he eventually dies. Three hours before he dies, he marries his fiance. And this made so much news, the government is now covering it. And his wife says, it's a disgrace. Stephen had to spend night and day fighting for a drug, but I'm proud he was able to pave the way for others to get it. Could you imagine being in that situation? You're dying of cancer. Here's the drug. You know, I put in my request last week. Here's a letter in the mailbox. Maybe this is it. Maybe they're going to cover me now. You find out they don't. They did it. Yeah, can, judgment party, can judgments be made by third parties? My brother has got three Harley Davidson motorcycles. He pays thousands of dollars for them. I wouldn't give you a dollar for a Harley Davidson. Okay. Different values. Value like beauty is in the eye of the beholder. That decision is made by the patient. It's not made by the, by the government what's valuable, what's not valuable for your care. And very, I'm, I'm not an economist, but in very simplistic terms, what do I see economically with the system? Here's where the flaw is. Party A buys from party, party B, party C pays. The patient buys from the doctor, hires a hospital pharmacy, the insurance company or the government pays. Think about our economic system. Party A pays, party A buys from B, party B sells it to A, there's not C. But in healthcare, we go A, B, C. A is a constant conflict with C. A always wants more because C is paying. C doesn't want to pay because they don't get anything for it. Now, where else did we see this? We saw this in Arizona a few years ago when they, when they had this.